You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, and we'll read together verses 35 through the end of the chapter. Now when day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen, saying, Release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now they're sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Every Jewish male, every head of Jewish household, every morning when he woke up, he would pray the same prayer. Lord, I thank Thee that I am not a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. Enough said. No. Seriously. Lord, I thank Thee that I am not a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. Now I have to confess something to you. I have thanked God that I am not a woman. Every time I saw one of my children being born, I thanked God that I am not a woman. But that prayer which was uttered by the head of every Jewish household, every leading Jewish male, Lord, I thank Thee that I am not a slave, a Gentile, or a woman, really did nothing more than to demonstrate the pride and the arrogance that was present in their heart. Lord, I thank Thee that I am not a slave. For in a Jewish man's mind, the slave was far inferior to him. He was superior to the slave. And if another man was a slave and he wasn't, then it must have been an indication that he was better in the sight of God than the slave. It must be because he was obedient to the Lord and righteous in the Lord's sight. And the Lord had all of that to commend the Jew for. Lord, I thank Thee that I am not a Gentile. Now here is how a Jew should have prayed. Lord, I thank Thee that Thou hast blessed me more than the other man by thy sovereign grace, not because of anything in me. But in the heart of a Jew, he was thinking to himself, I'm better than the Gentile. Yet it was nothing in the Jew that caused God to look down upon the Jew and bestow His blessings upon the Jew. It was not because the Jew was any greater or more powerful or more righteous than the Gentile, the non-Jew. Rather, it was God's sovereign grace that chose Abraham. It was God's sovereign grace that then chose Isaac. And it was God's sovereign grace that said of Jacob and Esau, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. Sovereign grace. So rather than thanking the Lord for the blessings that they had received and that they were not worthy of, the Jew said, I thank thee that I am not a Gentile. Must be because I'm better than non-Jew. And I thank thee that I am not a woman. Is because the Jewish man in the culture and time of Jesus' day and Paul's day, simply viewed women as inferior. They were property. And they had property rights over women back then. So a Jewish man, because he was better than a slave, better than the Gentile, better than a woman, would pray, Lord, I thank Thee that I am not a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. Interesting, is it not, that the church in Philippi was founded by those three types of people? A woman, Lydia, down by the riverside, the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Then there is the slave girl who was demon-possessed that Paul delivered. And then there is the Philippian jailer, the Gentile. The church in Philippi was started with a slave, a Gentile, and a woman. And a Jew would read Acts 16 and he would say, Come on, how in the world can God bless a work like that? How can you found a spiritual community on a slave, a Gentile, and a woman? No Jews converted that we read of in Philippi. A Jewish proselyte, Lydia, but a slave, a Gentile, and a woman? Well, friends, not only did the Lord found a spiritual work there, not only did He start a church with those three types of people, 
but it was one of Paul's most beloved churches. And we have been looking in recent weeks at the conversion of these three people. First, Lydia, in the first part of Acts chapter 16. She came to faith because the Apostle Paul went out to the riverside, and there he met with some women who were praying by the riverside on the Sabbath day. And the Lord opened her heart, and she became the first convert in Europe. Then on the way out to the to the Sabbath day meeting place by the river on the, one of the Sabbath days, Paul was ran across a demon-possessed slave girl, and he delivered her, which landed him in a jail, which landed him in front of the Philippian jailer, and the Philippian jailer then came to Christ. And then we get to the end of the conversion of this Philippian jailer, whose world was shaken by that earthquake, and who rushed in and fell down in front of Paul and Silas and said, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. That's God's promise. We get to the end of that story, how he had then been baptized and rejoiced greatly in the Lord. And our tendency is to read verses 35 through 40 as we rush on to the next city of Paul's journey, which is Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17. But there's something, I think, very interesting and very telling going on at the end of Acts chapter 16 with Paul and these magistrates. So we're not going to just pass over them. We get something, we get a glimpse into the character and the heart of the Apostle Paul in these verses that we are privy to in few other places. In verse 35, it says, When day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen saying, Release those men. Now apparently, the magistrates who had ordered Paul and Silas to be stripped naked in front of the crowd, beaten with rods, put in stocks, and put in prison, They obviously thought that a beating and a night in the slammer would be enough to sort of calm down these men who had supposedly caused a civil disturbance the day before. They're thinking to themselves, we'll punish them, we'll put them in prison, that'll be enough. And you remember that the owners of the slave girl had been upset when they saw their profit exercised out of the slave girl. So they're the ones that brought Paul and Silas before the magistrates and said they're creating unrest. They're turning our city upside down. Proclaiming things that it's not lawful for us to observe being Romans. Punish these Jews. And so the magistrates said, well, if they're turning the city upside down, we'll beat them, we'll put them in prison, that should do it. So when daybreak came, they sent with the policemen who had beaten Paul and Silas to the jail saying, release these men. Now, they had been busy that night. Do you remember that? It was about midnight, they were released, then they evangelized the jailer, and after that they went out to the well which was in the courtyard of the prison, And there the jailer demonstrated his love for the brethren by washing their wounds. Then they had a baptism service, and then they went into the house of the jailer, and they had a little midnight snack, and and spoke the word of God with that family, and led the family to the Lord, and they all rejoiced greatly, having believed on the Lord. All of that happened after midnight. It was a busy night. They had been busy all night long with the Philippian jailer's family. And now when daybreak came, Paul and Silas had, I think, voluntarily gone back into prison. Why would they do that? Really, it is out of love for the jailer, because... If when daybreak comes, these two prisoners whom the jailer had been told the night before to keep under secure confinement, if they were outside of the prison in the jailer's house, that would create some problems for the jailer, wouldn't it? He could lose his job, maybe even his life. So Paul and Silas go back into the jail until daybreak comes, and then the magistrates send for them and say, release them. So the jailer comes in to Paul, and I think with the best news that he could have possibly hoped to offer to the Apostle Paul, they've set you free. Go in peace. And the Apostle Paul's response had to have shocked the jailer. Verse 37, But Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public, men or without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison and are now sending us away secretly. No, indeed. Let them come themselves and bring us out. Now what's going on here? Why does Paul do this? What is he doing? Is he having some kind of a sit-in? I refuse to move from this jail cell until those magistrates come down and give me the escort out of this jail cell that is deserving of a Roman citizen. Is he pouting? What kind of an attitude is this? Just the previous night he was singing praise and thanksgiving to God in the midst of his suffering. And now it seems that Paul is demanding his rights. It seems that he's putting up kind of a huff and insisting that his rights as a Roman citizen be recognized. Is this a different attitude from the Apostle Paul? Is he acting a bit put out? Is he kind of pouting here? What's going on? You remember a couple weeks ago I told you that at the beginning of Acts chapter 16 it says that Philippi was a leading city of the district of Macedonia 
and that it was a Roman colony. And I told you back then, put on the shelf in your gray matter the fact that Philippi is a Roman colony because we're going to unpack that when it comes in important. And that's today. This is where it comes in important. Philippi was a Roman colony, and here's what that meant. In Paul's day, there were only a half a dozen or a dozen Roman colonies within the entire empire. These were cities that were specifically designated as colonies, and they had a special standing. They were free from taxation, which may explain why Lydia was plying her very expensive and very profit, profitable trade in Philippi, free from tax. If you could go somewhere in the United States and make money, one particular city, and be free from income tax, federal tax, state tax, county tax, property tax, death tax, tax on tax, and all those other taxes, you would go to that city and you would ply your trade because you could make more money. They were free from taxation. But furthermore, the city that was a Roman colony was answerable not to any of the other government around it, but directly to Rome. To illustrate this, it would be as if the city council of Kootenai was answerable not to the county, not to the state, but directly to the President of the United States and Congress. In other words, they were kind of like an island unto themselves. Their constitution was modeled after Rome. Their laws were all modeled after Rome. They were overseen not by any regional governments or any district-wide governments, but the magistrates, the two men who ruled in the Roman colony, were directly answerable to the emperor. Not to the local or state or provincial government, if you will. So they're free from taxation. They're answerable directly to the emperor. So if you were in Philippi, if you were going to be in any city in the Roman Empire and you would expect that justice would be done, that the law would be followed, and that the rights of a Roman citizen would be protected, you would expect it to be in a Roman colony. And the magistrates over that Roman colony have no food chain over top of them that they can appeal to and hide their injustice. In other words, those two men answer to the emperor. Now, Paul appeals to his Roman citizenship. It's another thing I want you to notice. Not only is it significant that, the Rome, that Philippi was a Roman colony, but it's significant that Paul appeals to his Roman citizenship. They have beaten us in public, without a trial, men who are Roman citizens. Both Paul and Silas were citizens of Rome. Why is that significant? Because not everybody was a citizen of Rome. In fact, few people were citizens of Rome compared to the amount of area and people within the Roman Empire. Roman citizens had particular... Uh, blessings of their citizenship, if you will. They were free from taxation. They couldn't be taxed. When a Roman citizen was born or when somebody acquired their Roman citizen either by Roman citizenship either by birth or by purchasing the citizenship, they got what was called a diptych. And it was a little folded wooden book, kind of like our modern day passport. And you'd open it up on its hinge and in both sides it was covered with wax and that was their Roman credentials. Likely Paul and Silas carried their little diptych, their little passport with them, which was evidence of their citizenship. A Roman citizen could not be um, taxed. A Roman citizen was not subject to any regional or local laws unless he consented to. In other words, it would be if I were in that sense a citizen, I could say, well, I'm subject to the federal government, to the president, to the Congress. I'm not under any state laws or county laws. All those things don't apply to me. I can just appeal directly to Rome. That's a nice little bonus, isn't it? They had to consent. Okay, I will consent to live under the laws of the state of Idaho. That's a neat little blessing. Furthermore, they could travel all over the Roman Empire without harassment, all the while claiming the protections of Rome. But here's the best. Here's the best blessing of being a Roman citizen. If you did something wrong and you wanted to avoid punishment, all you had to say was, civis Romanus sum. I am a Roman citizen. And they couldn't punish you. They couldn't scourge you. They couldn't imprison you. They couldn't put you in chains. They would go immediately to trial and nothing could be done to a Roman citizen unless he was convicted of a crime in a trial in court. Civis Romanus sum, exempt from punishment. Well, wouldn't that be wonderful? He was a Roman citizen. Now, Paul had been beaten. Paul had been tried. Paul had been put in the shackles. Sorry, not tried. He had been beaten, stripped naked, put in shackles, and imprisoned overnight. A Roman citizen. All without a trial. What's going on here? The bottom line is this. Paul's civil rights, his rights of a Roman citizen, have been trampled, they have been shredded, they have been destroyed publicly, and there were perhaps hundreds of people in Philippi 
all who were witnesses to this because it happened in the marketplace. In broad daylight, in front of all of these people, his Roman citizenship status had been shredded publicly. So what's he doing? You know what Paul's doing? He's playing his trump card. They've beaten me publicly. They've beaten me without a trial. They've imprisoned me. And now he's pulling out his card. Let them come down here to the prison and release me themselves. I want an escort out of the prison. I want the magistrates to come down here and I want them to escort me out, which would amount to a public apology. And Paul is holding what in his book and in their book is sort of the, um, how do you say it, coupe de grace? The, uh, the peak of the pinnacle, so to speak. He has this little piece of information that now is going to turn the tables on his accusers and on the magistrates. No, no, no. They're not going to just push me out the back door of the prison. They violated my civil rights. Let them come down here and release me themselves. Well, that's what he's doing. Now, you've got to ask yourself, why is Paul doing this? Paul, you have been set free. They are going to release you. Just walk away, Paul. You've been set free. There's no more trial, no more beatings, nothing else. Just walk out the back door of the prison, pretend like this didn't happen, go your way, go on to Thessalonica. Why doesn't the Apostle Paul just leave quietly out the back doors of the prison? You know why? Something else is going on here. Maybe you've already asked yourself the question, why didn't the Apostle Paul mention his citizenship before he was beaten? Did you ask yourself that question? When they were stretching him out in the marketplace and they said, strip them bare and beat them with rods and imprison them, why didn't the Apostle Paul cry out, Civis Romanus Sum, I'm a Roman citizen? Because the police wouldn't have beat him. The jailer wouldn't have put him in stocks and in the inner prison. The magistrates would have not have touched him. Turn over to Acts chapter 22. I want you to see a little incident in the life of Paul a little later on. It's in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 22, verse 22. He's giving his defense before the Jews in Jerusalem and he mentions how Christ said, I will send you far away to the Gentiles in verse 21. Look at verse 22. They listened to him up to this statement and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. For he should not even be allowed to live. And as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. But when they stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, listen to the irony of this, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who's a Roman and uncondemned? (gasps) They didn't know that, did they? The centurion's about ready to pick up a scourge and he's going to shred the back of the Apostle Paul and he asked the question, excuse me, is it lawful for you to do that? To scourge a Roman who's uncondemned? Look at verse 26. When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and he told him, saying, what are, you, what, what are you about to do? This man is a Roman. And the commander came to him and said, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. And the commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, but I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him. And the commander also was afraid when he found out he was a Roman because he had put him in chains. You know what you learn from that? You do not touch a Roman citizen. And that's all Paul did. They're about to beat him, and he says, excuse me, is it lawful to beat a Roman uncondemned? <clears throat> Put down the scourge, go to the commander. Do you have any idea what you're about to do? This guy's a Roman. And the commander comes up, are you a Roman? Yes, I am. And he was terrified because he had put him in chains. How much more of these magistrates who have beaten him with rods publicly, having stripped them naked before the crowd, put them in stocks, and left them for a night in the prison. So why didn't Paul just right before his beating in Philippi say, I'm a Roman citizen? Now some people will say, because listen, that's what you and I would have said, right? The minute somebody grabbed a rod and picked it up and raised it over their head, we would have cried out, Civis Romanus Sum! Don't beat me! I'm a Roman citizen! But Paul didn't do that. He took every last blow, every last whipping, every last lash with that rod, and then he suffered through the stocks and the imprisonment without ever mentioning he was a Roman citizen until they released him. Why? Is he insane? Or is there something more going on? Friends, there's something more going on. 
Paul did all of this. This is the beauty of this whole chapter. Paul did all of this, not for himself, but for the Philippian church. Let me explain this. Paul is using his civil rights, but it's not for his own honor. It is actually for the protection of the church and the believers in Philippi. Why? Well, those two magistrates who had had him stripped naked and beaten with robes and put in prison, those two men have to answer to the emperor. And now Paul is sitting in prison and he's saying, if they want this thing to end, it's going to end on my terms. I want them to come down and their coming down to the prison and releasing him and escorting him out publicly would have amounted to an apology. It would have amounted to an admission that he was innocent and that they were guilty. You see, they had defamed Rome. They had disgraced their office. They had disgraced the city of Philippi as a Roman colony. And now they could lose their office, perhaps lose their lives. And if this type of injustice was rampant in Philippi, the emperor could yank Philippi's status as a Roman colony and it would affect the entire city. So now they are hanging by a thread and the Apostle Paul has the scissors. And he's turning the tables. You come down and you release me. And he's doing it for this reason. It's the benefit of the church not the benefit of himself. And they say, how does this benefit the church? Am I ever glad you asked? Here's how it benefits the church. First of all, the Apostle Paul has turned the tables on his accusers. They said of him, he's a Jew, and he's causing civil unrest in Philippi, and we Romans shouldn't have to put up with these wandering Jews. And now the Apostle Paul sort of turned the tables. He said, I'm a Roman. I'm not a Jew. I'm a Roman citizen. And that was something that could not be claimed by many of the people in the city of Philippi. He's not only turned the tables on his accusers, he's also turned the tables on the magistrates. You see, now they're eating out of his hand. I'm a Roman citizen. Now do you think, this this would really, what this would serve to do, is it would serve to protect the church because these two magistrates would be a lot less likely to inflict any kind of illegal or unjust treatment on Paul, on the Christians, or on the church in Philippi. If Paul had just walked out the back door of the prison quietly and gone back to the house of Lydia without making this stand, it would have set a bad precedent. It would have set a precedent for those magistrates to abuse every missionary that came to town, every Christian in the town, and it would have actually encouraged their illegal and abusive behavior. But by making them come down and admit that he was a Roman citizen and that he was innocent, he has in effect dangling something over their head that is now going to make them think twice before they would do anything to the church in Philippi. Paul, All Paul would have to do is appeal to Caesar and go to Caesar, and those two men would be out of their life, out of their office, and perhaps Philippi's status in the Roman colony would be yanked. Do you think they're going to touch the church after Paul's gone? You think they're going to touch the church? Those two men are going to be on their best behavior. Why? They have trampled the rights of a Roman citizen. Now, Jim, do you really think the Apostle Paul would suffer a beating with rods and an imprisonment just to protect a bunch of Christians in the city of Philippi? You think he would do that? Do you even have to ask that question? Of course I think he would do that. That's the type of man that the Apostle Paul was. Why did he not claim Roman citizenship before he was beaten? For this reason, Everett Harrison in his commentary in the book of Acts, says that he feels that the Apostle Paul had this piece of information and he withheld it until it could be used for the most benefit for the entire church in Philippi. He has been beaten, his rights have been trampled, and he kept silent until he was released. And then the information comes out, I'm a Roman citizen, and the text says the magistrates were afraid. They had no idea this was the case. And now the Apostle Paul has sort of flipped it around. Now he can use that to the advantage of the entire church. Do I think that the Apostle Paul would suffer a beating for the blessing of that whole church and the protection of all of those Christians in it? Yes, I do. It was to the Philippians that Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 17, If I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice. You know what he's saying? My life is expendable for you. If I'm being poured out like a drink offering, if my life is being poured out like a vessel of water on your sacrifice, your service, and for your faith, Paul says, I can rejoice at that. Would he suffer a beating for the sake of those other Christians in Philippi in order that those magistrates might not abuse them? Certainly Paul would. 
And I think certainly Paul did. That's why Luke gives us all of this detail. Paul's making his stand and he's using his civil rights. He's using the blessings of the law, not for his own honor, not for himself, because that's not the type of man Paul was. He's using it for the blessing, the protection, and the benefit of all of the Christians in Philippi. Those men won't touch those Christians in Philippi after Paul leaves. Why? They don't want to do anything to make Paul mad. Why would they not want to make Paul mad? All he has to do is make one phone call, if you will, and it's over for them. And he can leave and the whole church is protected and blessed because he suffered for them. Friends, this is the mentality of the man who says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in lowliness of mind, esteem other people as better than yourself. Why did Paul take the beating? Paul took the beating for the protection of the whole church in Philippi. He esteemed other people as more important than himself, and he looked out not only for his own interests, but for the interests of others. That's the mind of Christ. That is sacrificial, brotherly love. That's what the Apostle Paul did in Philippi. So what's the result of all of that? Well, the, the, the just magistrates come down, verse 39. They appealed to them, and when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. Oh, how the tables have turned, huh? They can't expel a Roman citizen from any city in the empire without first being convicted by trial. Paul is innocent. No trial has taken place. So all they can do is bring them out publicly and say, could you please leave? I mean, I beg of you, please leave. Leave the city. Just just go away. They couldn't make Paul leave. They couldn't expel him. The last thing they're going to do is violate another one of his rights. And so all they can do, they're reduced to begging. Why do they want him out? Because if he stays there, it's a reminder of their own guilt and their own travesty of justice that they just oversaw. Not only that, but it's a guarantee that there's going to be more violence because people hate Paul. So rather than being in the position of control, the magistrates are begging, and rather than being in a prison, position of being in a prison, all of a sudden the Apostle Paul is in the place where the magistrates have to beg of him something. They can't command anything of him. Would you please leave? Well, Paul will leave, but not after he visits with the brethren first. So verse 40, he goes back to the house of Lydia where he's been staying since he arrived in Philippi and led her to the, the Lord at the river's edge. He goes back to the Lydia's house and there I think he stayed for probably a couple days while he recovered from the beating and got his supplies in order and got ready to leave town. He visited with the brethren, and look what verse 40 says. They saw the brethren and encouraged them and departed. You know what's odd about that verse? Who would you expect after being beaten, publicly humiliated, shamed, stalked, and imprisoned, imprisoned, who would you expect would need to be encouraged? Paul and Silas. It's you and I that would be moping around. Oh, woe is me. You'll never guess what happened to me. I was in the prison. Somebody needs to send me an encouragement card. Somebody needs to do something to Lord to lift my spirits up. After suffering, the Apostle Paul and Silas go back into the church and what do they do? Minister to other people. They encourage the brethren. We would expect that it would be Paul and Silas that would need to be encouraged. But they encourage the brethren. That's the type of man Paul was. He took a beating for these people. He allowed himself to be beaten in order to buy them protection, to leverage it for their good. And then after suffering, he comes back in and he ministers to the church at Philippi. Makes it really ring thick when we hear Paul say, look out not only for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. Friends, that's what the Apostle Paul meant when he said we're to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's what the Apostle Paul meant when he says we're supposed to have sacrificial love and consider other people's interests as more important than our own. And I ask you this morning, do you have that kind of sacrificial love for the brethren? Would you take that kind of a beating to protect somebody else? Another Christian? The household of faith? Would you do it cheerfully and praise God in the midst of it? And then on the other side of it, seek to encourage those whom you had been beaten for. That, my friends, is Christ-like love. That's the heart of the Apostle Paul. And that is why he and the Philippian church were like one. That's why there was so much love between the church at Philippi and the apostle who had started that church. They were indebted to him for everything. And they knew just how much he had laid down in line for them. We get to see in chapter 16 how our awesome God thwarts the attempt of Satan to destroy the church. Satan tried to infiltrate the church in the person of that slave girl and God brought a deliverance. And then Satan tried to 
persecute the church and destroy it from outside through persecution. And all it resulted in was what? The addition of a whole family to the church and it ended up buying the protection from the magistrates for the whole church in Philippi. Friends, as Paul says in Romans, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against God's elect? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for this passage of Scripture which gives us so much insight into the heart of Paul. And Lord, I would ask that You would work in our hearts and amongst our spirits and this body that kind of sacrificial, ardent, passionate, fervent love for the brethren. That You would teach us day by day what it means to lay our hearts down and to pour our lives out for each other. To be totally selfless and totally sacrificial in our love for each other in order that Christ might be glorified in and through His church both now and through all of eternity. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.